my day started rather well. I'm rather nervous about saying this with John uh, Lloyd in the room, um, but uh, my, my morning journey, the early morning train from Paddington, was rather spoiled by reading the FT this morning. I read the FT every day. I love the FT. Uh, but a piece by one of John's colleagues, um, which said, uh, and I quote, if I can read my writing, uh, 20 years uh, after the vote, um, the Welsh are still ambivalent. Are still ambivalent about devolution. It's tosh, of course. It's absolute tosh. And any kind of brief reference to credible polling, and there's plenty of credible polling around, um, would tell you that that's not where the debate is at now. Very unusually for the FT, they're sort of very behind the curve on that. Um, I think in 97, ambivalence was the name of the game. Uncertainty and lots of scepticism. Absolutely right. Um, but the world has moved on and Wales has moved on. So this week, um, as we know, we'll produce a, a mountain of coverage and commentary uh, on this uh, rather significant anniversary. Uh, it's also the anniversary of the Scottish referendum three years ago, so there's lots of anniversaries going on. It is a very significant anniversary. Uh, so this talk is my small contribution to that mountain of commentary, along with another equally modest one, which is, translate, which is transmitted this week um, uh, on BBC One Wales and S. Pedro Rec. Um, in July this year, I covered hundreds of miles meeting people in every corner of Wales, and it was a great experience, I have to say. Um, a bit of a luxury to be able to travel around for a few weeks uh, to make a documentary. Uh, and it was a very uplifting experience. And just to explain a little bit about it, because uh, some of you will uh, see it hopefully this week. Um, the idea for the documentary, and I worked with Martin Ingram on it at, uh, at Wales & Co, um, was to take the temperature in a devolved world, uh, talking to people who were doing exceptional things across Wales. Um, it wasn't conceived as a traditional political documentary, uh, and it wasn't conceived as a kind of trip down memory lane. There'll be plenty of that, uh, opportunities for that as well this week, and we've had a little bit today, um, and we all love that, but it's a different concept. So if it's, it's a trip down memory lane you want, you're going to be disappointed. Um, it's rather different. And we spent a lot of time identifying people across Wales who are doing things which we consider to be exceptional. Um, we spent a lot of time on our problems, and... Um, and uh, lots of our problems are significant ones, but we don't really focus on, you know, maybe what people are achieving. So we thought it was a good attempt to meet people who were achieving good things. I'll tell you a bit about the people we met. That's my son, um, <laughs> who's just started university in Edinburgh and probably wants money. Now, <laughs> and he ain't getting any. Um, a GP in North Wales, uh, Dr. Dylan Parry. Uh, who's been leading a campaign locally to recruit more young people, more young Welsh students into general practice. Why? Because there's been a bit of a crisis. The numbers have improved recently, it's true, but the projections for numbers in this area for the next few years are concerning. Um, that is a responsibility of the Welsh Government. Um, and it's perfectly valid to ask questions about whether policy in this area has been fruitful. Uh, why is it that a GP feels the need to take on a kind of campaign, freelance, so to speak, in this way? So, Delam was an interesting person to interview. A charity in Pontypridd running a food bank. Lots of food banks around South Wales. When we first ran a piece on uh, News of Ten several years ago, uh, during the coalition government, on the emergence of food banks, I got a very angry call from one of David Cameron's aides telling me that the story was made up. It was just nonsense, you know, some charity trying to make a name for itself. It was the Trussell Trust. Um, I didn't hear anything after that because the story just grew and grew and grew. Um, you know, some things are undeniable. So it was great to visit this charity in Pontypridd. Uh, we're doing fantastic work and we spoke to them and we spoke to someone they've helped out. A businessman in North East Wales, very interesting case, um, who's opened some of the most impressive private care homes anywhere in the UK. Um, and most of the residents there are funded by local authorities. And there's been quite a bit of controversy around whether it's the job of private providers to be offering this provision or whether local authorities are doing enough. Well, that's another debate, but what we did find was that 
the standard of care in these homes was astoundingly high. And it's a very interesting section of the film, I think, for lots of people, especially those who are either going through or may go through a business of having to think about parents in care at some point, or being in care themselves. Uh, it's a template, you may not like it, but it's a template. Um, and they can't cope with demand, by the way. Uh, a clothing manufacturer in Goslars in West Wales, who I happen to know um, from years ago, who's already counting the cost of Brexit before it even happens, in tens of thousands of pounds, exchange rate and all the rest of it. Uh, running a very, very successful business, but concerned. So we spoke to him and his son, and uh, they appeared, uh, you know, realistic about what the challenges were. A baker in Cardigan, um, who characteristically charged me for every single thing I took off the shelf during the film, um, <laughs> even though I didn't eat half of it, um, who was part of the most impressive high street revival in Wales. I uh, spoke to him about how Cardigan has changed. My last visit to Cardigan ten years ago was not a happy one because the place looked rather run down and the castle looked a complete mess. Um, not now. It looks fantastic, actually. And the high street is lively and vibrant. So we talked to him. We talked to um, a team of head teachers, three women in the Ronda, they were so impressive, who were leading the new super schools, the all-through schools, you know, the three to 19 schools that are being built. The one in, um, was it Tonnery Vale? 44 million pound build going on there. Um, they were very impressive, the head teachers. Um, you know, Leighton knows the area extremely well and probably knows the three of them very well. Um, but they were very excited about the plans and the possibilities while openly acknowledging that there had been major disappointments along the way in terms of Welsh performance in international league tables. And that very serious work needed to be done, as we've discussed in many interviews. Um, so it's not a, you know, it's not a fluffy feel-good thing. Um, there are challenges there, but I have to say, you know, they made a very good impression. A head teacher and governor in Newport, uh, who are running the first Welsh medium secondary school there, um, Gwent East Coed. They can't keep up with demand. They were impressive too. Parents demanding more places in primary and secondary uh, through, through the medium of the Welsh language. Um, and I just thought when I was there so much for all the toxic talk of coercion and compulsion that happens. Let's just nail that stupid myth because I'm fed up with it, to be honest. Um, and to, to hear that myth in my own kind of home patch in Carmarthenshire has upset me a great deal. So it was good to meet those and to be able to say, uh, well done, you're doing good work. Great to see them. So, the programme, as I say, not a trip down memory lane. Um, it's not reliving 97. That's not the purpose of it. It's looking forward. Um, and it's asking people whether they think devolution has made a difference to their lives. And in some cases, they say yes. Halen Morn, a company in uh, Anismorn, um, their sales director saying, look, you know, being part of the single market has been essential to us. Our Salt is being sold, you know, across Europe, and this is very important to us. We're very concerned what might happen to tariffs, etc., if, if we were out of the single market. Um, so, you know, people ask, asking about the effects of devolution, some of them less impressed. Um, the, the, the clothing company, Goslas, um, and this is actually quite instructive. I thought it was quite um, typical of lots of the responses strongly in favour of the devolved framework. Absolutely no question about it. Strongly in favour of the devolved framework. But not too impressed with lots of the performance. They don't want to go back to the old system. They really don't. But they'd like to see, you know, they acknowledge there have been some improvements, of course, and Carwin took us through some of them. But they'd like to see even more. I think it's fair to say that was the summary of where they, they were. Um, so, where are we? I'm grateful to the IWA for the invitation to come, obviously. Um, the invitation has been um, warmly accepted. Um, and I'm glad to see the IWA performing a very important role, can I say, uh, in Wales. We need to be sustaining it and encouraging it to grow because that process of mature reflection, 
serious intellectual application in terms of developing policy is crucial. And we don't have a lot of it, and the IWA is a, well, I can't just, it's a vital part of our public life in Wales. So I'm very pleased to be here. Oriol, thank you very much. Um, so we're in a very uh, changing world, but I think we're in danger of missing the big story, and I've alluded to it already with my reference there to the, to the FT. Um, we're terribly exercised about perceptions of individuals, of individual policies, of interesting and vital uh, government departments. Yes, we get very uh, exercised about that. Scrutiny of public and democratic bodies is vital. I hope we all agree on that. And Wales is rather lacking in that department, as I've already uh, made clear. But um, this week is rather different in a way. I don't want to undercut the theme. Um, it's about marking a special anniversary, um, an anniversary that represents something quite remarkable. And I wanted to say something rather personal here. Um, an anniversary that as a teenager I thought would be just a fantasy. Um, something that, you know, I would never see. Um, and to explain why, I'd like in just a few minutes to take you back to the winter of 78, uh, going into 79. Um, and I was a sixth former at that time at Llanelli Grammar School. Um, the, in the dying days of the grammar school system in Carmarthenshire, um, preparing for my A-levels and uh, my subsequent move to Cardiff University. Um, and my main problem during that period of revision was distraction, uh, political distraction. I was already a bit of a tragic anorak at that point. Um, and the Wales Act of 1978 um, which Labour had, uh, had passed, of course, to some extent because it feared the march of Plaid Cymru, that was the uh, context, um, had arranged for that referendum on St David's Day 79, and we heard some references to it earlier. I don't want to repeat too much, but just to say a couple of things about my personal experience of that campaign, because Leighton is absolutely right. You cannot understand the dynamics of 97 if you don't fully understand the dynamics of 79. And you don't need really to have lived through 79, as long as you understand the dynamics. But my God, if you lived through 79, <laughs> you know, 97 was heavily overshadowed by that, for everyone that I knew. Um, my late father, for, for those of you who've just landed from another planet, um, and there are a few of you, was a prominent Plaid Cymru supporter. And uh, surprise, surprise, an enthusiastic backer of the uh, Eerdros Gymru campaign. And our house was full of posters and the hallway and stickers and all the rest of it. He was out canvassing and speaking uh, most nights of the week. Um, and I followed the campaign clearly, trying to revise a bit, lots of TV and radio. Uh, and I was increasingly alarmed, really, by, uh, well, by the venom, really, of the campaign. It was a venomous campaign. <laughs> you think the Brexit campaign has been unpleasant? It's a tea party in Thundering Dot Wells compared to... 1979. It was toxic. Really, really bad. Um, you know, that kind of thing puts you off politics for life. Um, and I think that it was very sad, really, that uh, it became mired in all kinds of uh, very unpleasant debates about people who spoke Welsh or didn't speak Welsh, um, North versus South and East versus West and all the rest of it. I like to think that some of those people who were part of that campaign have, you know, had cause to think a little bit about the, the role they played, but I have no, I have no idea. Uh, but it was not a great service to democracy at that point. Um, the only thing you can say is that Wales certainly, as part of that democratic exercise, made a very clear decision. And you have to respect these decisions, especially when they're as clear as 80-20. Um, for some in Labour, of course, and this is something I've, I've written a piece for The Guardian today. It's been retweeted by Alan Davis, so it's got to be bloody good. Um, and, um, and, you know, because he's a tough guy to please. Uh, some knowing nods in the room. Um, and it basically goes over lots of ground that, you know, all of you will be familiar with. Um, so I'm apologising if it's a slight repetition, but it's kind of a little bit of a personal take on it, um, given that I'm very interested in uh, history of politics in Wales, certainly since uh, the turn of the 20th century, and more particularly since the Second World War, because there are some major political figures, certainly in, in the Labour Party since then, who some of whom, I think inexplicably, have not been given their proper recognition. Um, so for some in Labour, uh, and in some other parties, especially for the governing party, of course, it was the worst moment of their political lives, that 79 result. For others, it was great. 
but uh, there were certainly people I know who were deeply upset by the result. Um, and I'm talking really about the political heirs of, more than anyone else, uh, Jim Griffiths, the first Secretary of State for Wales, uh, appointed in 1964, as we know, as the first Secretary of State, um, and the Welsh Office, now the Wales Office, established in 1965. Um, Jim Griffiths, who, by the way, is the subject of a fantastic new biography by Ben Rees, um, long overdue. Um, Ben's going to produce uh, uh, an English version very soon. I think it's, it's gone to press already. It's well worth a read. It's a fantastic story of um, the development of uh, not just Labour Party politics, but Labour thought really, since the 30s. Jim Griffiths was, of course, a miners' leader, miners' agent, and then became South Wales miners' leader. Um, and after that, rose to become deputy leader of the party. Um, but really a kind of forgotten hero, I think, for Labour today. Um, hopefully some people will read the book. He was a highly respected figure. who slowly come to the view that Whitehall needed a department that focused on Welsh problems and found Welsh solutions to Welsh problems. Uh, it took him a while to come to that view, but he did come to that view, uh, based on his own experience in Whitehall. Um, just imagine how difficult it would be for you know, some of his less impressive successors, and some of them have been named already, if he found it difficult. If he found it difficult to get Whitehall to treat well seriously, well, you know, others possibly had no chance. That's even if they put in the effort in the first place. Um, Griffiths' Labour allies, we know who they were, they included Cledwin Hughes and others, um, had been helped in a way, but also traumatised by that 1966 victory by Gwynmore Evans. It helped in the sense that Harold Wilson then sat up and suddenly took the you know, demands from within Labour for economic aid for Wales more seriously. And there were some very significant Welsh Labour figures who were on that side of the argument, including Cledwin, who I knew very well, had the highest respect for, Alistair Morgan, uh, Gwilym Priest Davis, who uh, my father was very friendly with, um, and coincidentally um, lived for the last few years of his life um, two streets away from me in South London uh, with his daughter, Catherine. So we used to meet and have a chat in, uh, in our part of South London. It was very nice to um, be able to talk to him, especially about his book, which was published around 10 years ago, which is called Canheyav Haner Kandrev, which is a story of 50 years in public life. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the best political memoirs um, of the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, John Morris, of course, and other people too. They were all in this camp, yes? Um, and they were all in the camp of trying to think, okay, where do we go from here? Uh, so you go via Kilbrandon, you get the Wills uh, Act of 78, you get St. David's Day, 1979, and then... Oh, and by the way, I, I'm always having to tell people as well about 79, you forget that there was that 40% threshold inserted into the 79 referendum. Um, George Cunningham, a Scottish Labour MP who I think was the MP for Islington, um, backed by Neil Kinnock, insisted on inserting this 40% threshold because they said the constitutional change was so great that it needed a minimal threshold, which was eventually adopted. It's interesting given the constitutional importance, that no such threshold was inserted, of course, in the referendum last year yeah. for the EU. Um, I'm just making the comparison because this is not something that is unprecedented. This is not something that's unfamiliar. And when I mention the threshold to people, they say, oh, well, you know, that's ridiculous, that doesn't happen. Yes, it actually does happen. And uh, it's for people to reflect on whether that referendum was constructed in a way that, you know, reflected the seriousness of it. It's not for me to answer, but I'm simply putting the question out there. Um, Jim Callaghan, of course, Prime Minister. I think I'd be kind in saying that he was lukewarm about his own government's proposals. Um, I remember one speech he made right at the end of the campaign, I think it was at the Brangwyn, um, where he sort of worked his way to a kind of resounding vote yes at the end of the speech. It was about as convincing as Theresa May's nothing has changed during the last election campaign. Um, um, <laughs> You know, people aren't daft, okay? When stuff happens, people, people see it. Um, the result, as we know, was a crushing defeat. Um, and eventually, lots of those Labour people who'd had doubts in 79 came through the 80s, as we've heard, um, and had a different take on things. Um, and they felt that politically, Wales wasn't in a position to defend itself. Um, 
and we got to 97, and I think it is absolutely right to say that Tony Blair's popularity played a part. Carwin introduced a very interesting theme, didn't he, about uh, people thinking, oh, we've got a Labour government, we don't need anything else. That is, I think that is a very valid uh, train of thought, but I'm also certain that Blair's popularity and his energy in the campaign played a huge part. Um, but then so did people like Leighton, Peter Hain, um, Ron, Kevin there, and Rodri and other, other people. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's invidious sort of list, isn't it? But there are people who worked very hard. But, you know, I think Tony Blair's leadership in that was absolutely instrumental, um, especially when you see the margin of, uh, at, at the end of it, um, a margin so narrow that the verdict could, couldn't be confirmed until the very last vote had been counted. But as I said at the start, a quick ring to Vaughan, they'd have found out straight away. Um, <clears throat> moving on, my dear friends. Um, I had the privilege of knowing the late John Smith quite well um, and enjoyed lots of lunches and conversations with him. And of course, uh, it was his compelling phrase um, that resonated with people when he talked about the settled will of the Scottish people. Uh, well, there was no such settled will in Wales, as we know. Um, the settled, well, actually, there was. There was a settled will in 79, and it was vehement opposition. That's pretty settled. 80 to 20 is pretty settled. Um, by the time you get to 97, it's uncertainty, ambivalence, if I can use the FT's word today. That certainly was true in uh, 97. Um, and there are, there's an interesting little theory about what happened in 79, which I'm, I'm still kind of grappling with. And when we made the, the, the series on the story of Wales a few years ago, this was something that reared its head then. Um, what, were, what were the factors behind the 79 result? And unless you understand those factors, you can't understand why the transition was rather slow. Um, and the view among lots of people, one which I reflected in the series, was people had come out of the 79, 78, 79 winter of discontent. Um, there was a lot of economic hardship and pain, lots of suffering, and people really wanted to concentrate on bread and butter issues and not on great constitutional questions. Um, I think there's some truth in that. But I'm also bound to say, given the fact that other factors came into play, um, it was obscured too by rather nebulous notions of nationhood, uh, what is Welshness, um, what is Britishness? Um, and if anybody queries that, I think, why else would the, the language issue have reared its head? So they were pertinent issues as well. It wasn't just a question of um, economic necessity and economic focus. Um, there was also a kind of all-pervading deference to Westminster. I mean, I saw it firsthand, uh, which I think was still with us until well into the 90s, actually, in some form. But it all changed in 1997. That sense all changed in 1997. Um, so now we have um, the most recently published opinion survey. And Roger, I don't want to steal Roger's thunder because he's got all the stats. Um, but I think it's safe to say, Roger, without wrecking your presentation, which is coming up, that uh, Without you, well, I won't use the figures then. I'll, I'll leave them out. Um, every credible survey suggests overwhelming acceptance. I think the word acceptance is better than support in a way. Overwhelming acceptance of our devolved settlement right across Wales. Yes, it is true. Um, there is a minority. The latest, I think, is you know, 12, 14%. There is a minority who still favour uh, the old system, um, and there are people who question whether this devolved settlement is delivering. But I think there are two things we need to separate here. One is whether people think that devolved government is healthy, and secondly, whether they think it's doing a good job. They're two very separate questions, and to conflate them is, I think, unhelpful and possibly dangerous. Um, I spent, well, nearly 15 years, I think about 13 years, um, I lost count by the end, as a political journalist at Westminster, working for BBC Cymru and then for uh, 
BBC News in London on, uh, on their network desk, ending up as chief political correspondent for the BBC News Channel, which was one of the best years I had there. Um, and I'd say to you in this audience today, I kind of witnessed at first hand the way that Wales was uh, dealt with at Westminster, and it wasn't a pretty sight, okay? Um, you know, the Welsh Select Committee, I'm bound to say this, did some excellent work. Um, and I'm thinking particularly when it was chaired by people like Gareth Wardell or Howell Francis, you know, produced some fantastically valuable work. So please don't think I'm denigrating that. I'm not. But I'm talking about the wider picture. Um, you know, parliamentary debates on Welsh matters, even those that have been organised months ahead, they'd be cancelled, you know, for the flimsiest reason. Uh, some relatively unimportant vote or parliamentary motion, you know, get rid of the Welsh Day debate, we've got other stuff to do. That was quite routine. Um, Welsh questions was, well, you know, there were times when it was useful, but most of the time it was a bit of a pantomime, um, once a month. Uh, and that was the kind of degree of scrutiny, really, of the, of the Welsh office, um, unless the Welsh Select Committee was doing something specifically on the Welsh office's role. Um, there were entertaining sessions. Um, Peter Walker, who I have to say, you know, yes, a Worcester MP and yes, a Conservative, um, was a very impressive operator. And uh, I have to say, on a journalistic level, um, it, it was quite illuminating to see a very senior Whitehall figure like Peter Walker marching through the corridors of power because he brought a bit of clout to the Welsh office that he hadn't had for a long time. People f just didn't clock that. And a clout that it hasn't had under quite a few secretaries of state. So it was interesting to see Peter Walker operating um, and the way that he thought the Welsh office should uh, be far more strategic in the way that it managed the Welsh economy and public services. And he was up against Alan Williams, uh, not Carmarthen, Swansea West, uh, who was another impressive parliamentary operator. That was a pretty high quality combination. Um, you know, didn't see it very often, I'm afraid. There were, you know, there are MPs, Welsh MPs have worked very hard over the years to change things, um, and I, I respect what they've tried to do, um, but they were working within a very antiquated system, um, which in effect, I think, thwarted their ability to change things. So anybody telling me that, you know, Wales was better governed when Westminster grudgingly devoted some time to Welsh affairs, I'm sorry, I, I can't agree with that. And I don't care how disillusioned you are with the way that the Welsh government works, if you are dis disillusioned, the answer is not, categorically not, to go back to a time when Westminster deigned to give the odd day to Welsh affairs. It's just unthinkable. It's unthinkable. Modern democracies don't work like that. Just look around the world. Um, I met one guy over the summer when I was filming who was pretty vehement in his view that, you know, this whole devolution lark, as he put it, was just a waste of money and more bureaucracy, the kind of arguments that people were having back in 1979. Um, and I tried to say politely, well, you know, people take the view that government closer to the people um, does stand a better chance of delivering results than government which is far from the people, you know? And that's the kind of principle we base it on. It could be a Conservative administration in Cardiff. It could be applied Cymru one. It could be a Lib Dem one. It could be whatever. Um, but, you know, you can make a judgment on how it performs, but the principle of the framework is very, very important. A quick word then, because I've been uh, far too slow on scrutiny. Um, scrutiny is not where we want it to be. Um, I'm speaking now after the demise of my own programme, The Wills Report, um, after five years, and I'm very pleased with what we achieved in that five years, but you know, things move and things change. Um, it taught me quite a few things about operating in a Wales context, um, which I hadn't done as intensively for some time, so it was quite a, an interesting um, five years for me in that sense. Um, on the whole in Westminster, something to be said about Westminster in one way, on the whole in Westminster, if you put in a, a bid for an interview in a Westminster Whitehall department, um, as a general rule, I mean, there are exceptions, yeah? As a general rule, the answer will be yes. The default answer is usually yes, and this is a very good reason not to do the interview. 
Uh, my experience in the first couple of years, certainly, of doing the Wales Report was that the default answer in Cardiff was no. Why should we do it? Oh, what's it about? Oh, what are you going to ask? A reluctance. There were notable exceptions to that. One of them is here, uh, in the shape of Mr. Andrews. And others, too. I mean, I don't want to go through a list, but when I think, you know, uh, uh, Mark Drakeford and Jane Hutt and some of the others were, were, were very willing. So this is, not, you know, there are exceptions, okay? But I am making a general point, and the point is valid. You know, it took three years for us to get an interview with the economy minister, for example. Is that good? I'm really sorry. It's not good enough. It's just not good enough. And the thing that puts people off is that it's not an interview, you know, for two or three minutes for a news clip. If you sit down with someone for half an hour, you've got a chance to sort of have a bit of an exchange. And for me, the only effective form of broadcast scrutiny in politics is a one-on-one -on -one exchange. Yeah, it may be old-fashioned. And yes, for you know, young, excited commissioners, it may not be you know, as moving around as much as they'd like and singing and dancing and you know, all the Twitter stuff going on and you know, people sort of adding their thoughts. That's fine. That's fine. We, we, you know, that's, that's okay. That's absolutely fine. But let's not allow that to totally replace um, the traditional one-to-one -one interview which, let me tell you, when it's done well and when it's with uh, someone that people want to hear from, we'll get a decent audience. Don't let people tell you that you know, these programmes don't score in audience terms. You put out an interview for 30 minutes with the First Minister after BBC News at 10, obviously that's watched by many millions of people, um, you know, more than anyone else, um, and you then pick up a quarter to 11 with the Wills Report, a half an hour with Catherine Jones, it gets a very, very good audience. People value that. People value the fact that they're being challenged on specific points. What's happened with the circuit of wheels? What's happening with waiting times? What's happening with your PISA results? Come on. Five or six questions on that. Seven or eight questions on that. And it's sad that, you know, some ministers don't want to do it. And some ministers are very keen to do it. So scrutiny is not where we want it to be. And that's partly then, as I'm suggesting to you, Partly um, a factor of willingness, or lack of willingness. Um, I think it's, by the way, can I just say, uh, I think it's changed. I saw notable change towards the end of our run. Um, and that factor of willingness changed quite significantly by year four and year five. So let me commend that. Um, but it's also to do with, um, what would I say, capacity. Capacity. Um, we don't have the uh, the manpower and the woman power to be able to scrutinise uh, to the extent and the depth that we should be able to do. Uh, Welsh media is uh, considerably poorer than it was 20 years ago. Uh, lots of people have abandoned the field. Some of our great newspapers, um, even those which are aggressively partisan, and most of them are. Um, you know, no longer have representatives, or they park them in Bristol, and then they work. Then they wonder why they don't get the story right, uh, or they appear to be sort of you know hundreds of miles away, <laughs> which they are. Um, you know, so that's been a big letdown, and it's made the job much more difficult. And for the BBC in Wales, the burden is heaviest of all. Now, you, you could say, and some of you will say, quite right. Licence speed demands and the Royal Charter demands that. You do, these, you do this work, and that's, you know, of course, that is true. But it's not healthy for the BBC to be providing, you know, the vast majority of that provision. Um, it's just not. And there needs to be um, a much more rich tapestry of journalistic activity than there is. But there are signs of growth in some areas, but I think that... Uh, where things stand now, it's, not, it's, it's, it's really not where we want it to be. Um, and I would appeal to you know, people to think a little more about what are the areas of journalistic activity that they can sustain and support, which add to what's already there, because it'll be appreciated and it needs to be encouraged, especially people coming out of some of our, you know, Cardiff is some of the best journalism students 
graduating from Cardiff University. It's, the, it's one of the best journalism schools in the world. Um, and Cardiff graduates from journalism are very respected. You know, we need to be encouraging more of those to be thinking, lots of them are Welsh-based, to be thinking about careers. Unlike mine, you know, when I detached myself at an early stage, partly because I felt I had no choice in terms of what was available here, encouraging people to pay more attention to their home patch. Um, a lot has changed since that momentous night in C1, in uh, Studio C1 in September 97. I'm bound to say, um, the wonderful Barry Jones is no longer with us. Um, he was superb as the political analyst on the night. Great company, immensely knowledgeable, and understood the demands of that role to condense lots of information, to make analysis pithy, to respond quickly to things, and to, to have a human touch. I'm gobsmacked, he said, when the result came through. People understand that. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, my good friend Robin Oakley, who's left the BBC many years ago, uh, the great Peter Snow, who was on graphics, he's retired. Um, but some things don't change, and that is our determination to provide a high standard of coverage um, and analysis. That hasn't changed. Um, we don't get it right all the time. Uh, there'll be people queuing up to tell me that, and I know that. Um, but I just want to give you an assurance that there is a big team of people in Cardiff and in London who want to get it right and to make every effort to get it right. Um, and the notion that we somehow set out not to get it right is probably the most offensive notion of all. Um, it's a very important task. It's a very important task in this process and where the BBC has been relied on to give people information which they use at election time, there is no more important task. I'm going to end on uh, some of John Smith's words, having made my point about scrutiny. Um, he said, devolved government is about providing government that is closer to the people. And uh, I think that's what the name of the game is. And it's unthinkable now to go back to where we were before. So devolution is here to stay, my dear friends. The question now is, putting ambivalence and all that stuff to one side, what do we do with it in the next 20 years? Thank you.